What's up guys, Anastas and Dyson here with Subtle Cinematics and today we're going to be doing a comparison video on the Lumix S1 and the Zcam E2S6. I have owned the Lumix S1 for about one and a half years I'd say. Um, I've been using it on pretty much all of my shoots in the past year and a half and absolutely love it. It is a DSLR camera, so it is gonna be going up against the Z cam, which is a cinema camera. I've been using this camera here for about uh, three to four months. So far, I got it pretty recently and I upgraded from the Sony a7 III. Honestly, so far, uh, it beats out the a7 III by a million times. I love this camera, um, and I'm super excited to kind of get into this, this comparison. So before we get into this review, we're gonna lay over a bunch of clips. We're not gonna tell you guys which clips were shot off of what camera, but we're gonna show you a bunch of clips of the Lumix S1 mixed in with the Z cam right here. All right guys, so Dice and I went out this morning and we filmed some comparison videos in terms of dynamic range, slow motion, different frame rates, and we're gonna lay over the clips as we kind of uh, compare both of each camera setting to each other. So right now we're gonna start with the dynamic range test. So we have the clip right in front of us here, we'll lay it over right now. Um, so what you're seeing now is the Lumix S1 and comparing it next to the Z cam. The S1 says it's rated for 14.5 stops and the Z cam S6 says it's rated for 14 stops. I mean, I think both of these cameras are gonna give you a great look in dynamic range area. I don't see really any highlight clipping. It basically comes down to the user. And all these settings too were the exact same. We were shooting at 4K24, shooting at uh, 150th the shutter for the S1 and for the Z cam we were shooting at 180 degrees. So in terms of dynamic range, we're gonna be putting up a little scoring system here. And at the end, we're gonna have a final score, whether the S1 takes it or the uh, Z cam. So for this, honestly, it's a draw. Um, the dynamic range, I mean, as Dyson literally just said, it looks pretty similar. I mean, they have like very close to the same stops of dynamic range. So for this, it's 100% a draw. The next category we're gonna be going over is the ergonomics. With the Z cam, once you buy this camera, you really only get the brain of it. Uh, you, As you guys can see here, you have to rig this system out because it basically just comes as the box and it's great, but you have to definitely spend some extra money in order to actually have this as a usable camera. So a lot of the times you do have to kind of go through and switch out settings based in the menu system. However, I will say that they do have customizable buttons. The, all five of these are customizable as well as some on the top. So these are buttons that are in great positions. I love where they put them. So overall, I feel like ergonomically, this has a great camera, except obviously it's only the brain. So you have to really rig it out to make it an ergonomic camera that, for example, having a side handle where you can comfortably hold it, because otherwise you won't be able to just comfortably hold this camera as soon as you get it. So moving on to the S1. So again, this is a DSLR. Really all you need is a camera lens and SD card and you're ready to roll. In terms of the feel, you definitely don't need a cage, obviously. You can rock it handheld exactly how it is coming out of the box. So personally, I love the side grip here in the handle. I think it just fits my hand really well. I felt on the Lumix GH5 that I used to use before the S1, my pinky would kind of like slide off the edge. It just wasn't really big enough. So um, I like that I can get a good grip on here. Um, the boxy kind of look that the S1 has just kind of screams durability. Like it's a very durable camera. And other than like the feel of the camera and your hand, I love the button layout. I think the button layout is super simple. You've got your white balance ISO up here and then your off and on switch is super easy to access. Your shutter and your aperture is all on the one side so you can just quickly uh, make any changes necessary on set or if you need to um, maybe change a camera setting in like literally two seconds, you can do that. You can just flick these switches. So in terms of who wins the ergonomic section, it would have to be the S1 just because 
it's so run and gun. Like you can pick this thing up, shoot, and you're good to go. Um, all the button layout is in like the perfect position in my opinion. And it's definitely more beginner friendly just because all you have to do is slap a lens on here and you're ready to roll. So the next category we have is the low light test. So we're gonna start with the Lumix S1. We took a clip that we'll lay over right here of a Canon 1DX Mark II next to a candle light. So for the Lumix S1, it has dual native ISO. So you can get basically little to no grain at all at 4,000 ISO, and then it kicks in again at 8,000 ISO. So if you're filming at 3,200 ISO, just simply bump it up to 4,000. If you need to be shooting at that high of an ISO, either set it to 4,000 or 8,000. So I'd say that when you pass the 2000 ISO mark is when you're gonna to start to see some grain on the Lumix S1. Again, once you bump it to 4000 and then 8000, dual native ISO kicks in and you see little to no grain. I feel that when the dual native ISO kicks in though, it seems like Lumix kind of soften the image up a bit. Like it doesn't look as sharp. So it's not gonna look as clean as if you were shooting at like 640 ISO or 1000 ISO even 2000 ISO, it's just not gonna look as sharp. It softens up a little bit. And with the Z Cam, the Z Cam basically has a base ISO of 400 and 1250. Typically with a cinema style camera, you don't really wanna be shooting in low light necessarily all the time. Um, most cinema cameras aren't really made for that. They're made for that kind of production life and having correct lighting. So definitely the Z Cam notices a bit of grain right away compared to the S1 once you get to the higher ISOs. Another thing to mention is this is a super 35 millimeter sensor, whereas the S1 is a full frame. So for this category, I definitely think the S1 wins. So the next category we're talking about is autofocus. Now the Z Cam does have autofocus. However, I definitely would recommend against using it. I uh, definitely have never used it on an actual set. The only time I could see you actually using the autofocus on the Z Cam is if you're doing an interview and the subject is not gonna be moving at all, or basically you could be getting your focus from the autofocus and then just kind of switch it back into manual focus and change things out. Just because I do tend to find that the Z Cam uh, will hunt a lot and it's definitely not a type of autofocus that you'd wanna be using all the time. And that's kind of what you expect from a cinema camera just because most of the time you're using manual focus anyways, or you're having an actual focus puller rather than relying on your autofocus. So for the S1, the autofocus is actually also terrible, but it's still usable to a certain extent. Um, I personally don't take a lot of photos, but I've heard of a lot of S1 and S1H users that do use the S1 for photos, and they seem to think that the autofocus is actually pretty decent for photos. Now for video, in my opinion, it's terrible. Like I've never used it once for video since I've owned this camera and honestly, same with the GH5. I have never once used the autofocus for video, 100% manual focus. And I'm okay with that just because I don't want the autofocus to be hunting and mess up a perfect shot. Because the autofocus is somewhat usable on the S1, but not really usable at all on the Z Cam, the S1 takes it by not by a lot. So the next category we have is the color science. So for the S1, um, the color science is actually pretty accurate. Um, I'd say that S1 and Canon are like a top three for sure for color science for DSLR cameras. I think it's pretty accurate. Um, I will say that it's a little on the yellowy side than anything, but other than that, it is pretty natural, very easy to color grade and get a very natural looking grade on um, the camera but so we'll hand it over to Dyson just because um, the Z Cam is a super 35 millimeter sensor. It is a cinema camera and the color science is actually pretty amazing on this. Yeah, so I absolutely love the color science on this coming from a Sony a7 III where the color science is pretty whack. Uh, the Z Cam is a nice upgrade. You do have to make a couple little minor tweaks while you're actually in the color grade and editing a little bit but it's something that's so minor that I think the color science straight out of the camera with Rec 709 looks so damn good. And so with the color grade, you still have the Z-Log, you also have raw capabilities. So that is amazing for color grade, having that ability to kind of change all of your settings that you need to uh, in the editing, as opposed to messing up a shot in camera. It's pretty awesome. And then since it is a cinema camera, just something about the colors 
I don't know what it is. I don't know how to really explain it, but something about the colors and the image of this camera just look so good. Yeah, and I mean, with the S1, you don't get that soft look that a cinema camera has. It's kind of hard to explain, but cinema cameras just have that cinematic look right out of the camera. You don't really have to adjust too much on the color grading side to get that like cinema camera right out of the box look. Or with the S1, I guess, or any DSLR, they're typically very sharp almost too sharp to be 100% like real looking opposed to the cinema camera. But the Z cam takes it for this um, just because you get that cinema grade look. Um, it's being shot off of a cinema camera and it looks amazing right out of the body. So the next category that we are talking about is usability right out of the box. And for this one, the Z cam does not do very well, but that's expected because it is a cinema camera every cinema camera you get most of the times you kind of have to rig it out in one way or another and so for example with the z cam i have a cage which is a completely necessary accessory you need to have it um, that way you can have you know your side handle your top handle as well as your external monitor you need to have the external monitor because this one inch screen is not going to be enough while you're actually on shoots z cam actually has a app that you can use with your phone that will show you basically what you're looking at and you can also change some of the settings so you can change your iso white balance all those things can be done within the app so you can use that as a monitor it doesn't look very professional if you're using that on higher paid shoots i would definitely recommend only using it kind of as a second monitor or if something happens and HDMI cable breaks and you are in desperate need of using the app, then definitely use it. But I think usability of the box Z cam um, isn't that great just because you can't really use it right out of the box. Now moving on to the S1, usability is great. It's a DSLR. It offers everything right out of the box that you would need to start shooting literally the day that you get the camera as long as you have a lens really. So it does have the flip out screen here. So it just tilts out and then you can tilt it up and down. It also does have an option where you can flip it out to the side like this. I rarely ever use this, but you do have that option. I've gotten pretty used to the tilt screen. Um, the GH5 did have the flip out screen, which I really liked, but the more I use the S1, the more I just seem to really like this um, type of setup here with the tilt. Usability is just super simple. Going through the menu system on Lumix is really simple. I've used the G7, G9, uh, GH4, GH5, and the S1, even an S1H, and the menu system is just so straightforward, very easy. You know, I can switch up frame rates extremely, extremely quickly, even if you set up the um, the custom options here. So you have C1, C2, and C3. So my C1 can be set to 4K 24 FPS. My C2 can be set to 4K 60 FPS if I want the option to get 60 FPS shots. And then my C3 can be used for my higher frame rates such as 150 or 180 FPS. And literally all I have to do is just click around here and then set my aperture and my shutter speed values and away I go. So um, for this category, the S1 takes it. So the next category we're gonna touch on is resolution. So the Lumix S1, the highest resolution that you're gonna shoot for video is 4K in 10 bit. So that is the highest you're gonna get, um, 4K, 10 bit in 24 FPS and 30 FPS. And then it downscales to 8 bit when you get into 60 FPS, as well as the high vari variable frame rates of 150 and 180 FPS. Now for the Z cam, it actually shoots up to 6K, which is awesome if you're doing um, anything with the green screen, if you need to be kind of zooming in a little bit. So this could actually potentially work as an A cam and a B cam. Definitely wouldn't recommend it, but you can shoot your A cam with the Z cam here, and then you can actually crop in and scale and move your X and Y axis so that you could potentially get a B cam. So having the option to have 6K it also does do 4K, 2.8K, and 1080, and it does give some different resolutions. So for example, you can shoot in 6K open gate as well. So you get the full range of the sensor, which is pretty awesome, as well as you have the option for 241, which is gonna automatically kind of give you that letterboxing, which is mostly used either in movies or kind of narrative films. So I think definitely the Z cam will take this category. The next category that we are talking about is in-body image stabilization. Now. This camera doesn't have in-body, so automatically off the bat, the S1 is gonna do a way better job because it is one of the best in-body image stabilization in the industry. Um, however, with the Z cam, since it is kind of that cinema camera, 
what I find is the in body isn't necessarily needed. If you're walking correctly, it'll give a really cool looking image because you're not gonna have the micro jitters that you would have with a DSLR or a mirrorless camera. The shakes that you get seem way more natural, but I think handheld with a cinema camera just looks something completely different. So as Dyson said, the in-body image stabilization systems on the Lumix cameras are absolutely insane. So Lumix introduced the IBIS into the GH5 when they brought the GH5 onto the market, and it was unbelievable. Now, granted, it was a micro four thirds sensor, which is why it was so good. When they said that they were bringing really good IBIS technology to the S1, I was a little skeptical at first just because it was a full frame sensor. So way bigger sensor on this camera than the Lumix GH5. However, this thing has 5.5 axis of stabilization. It's absolutely unbelievable. For a full frame sensor, it's just insane. Um, I can get really smooth handheld shots without using a gimbal when I have all the IBIS options turned on on this camera. Um, it's, I would say, the best full frame in-body image stabilization um, camera on the market to date, hands down. Um, I have yet to see or hear about another um, new camera body that's a full frame sensor that's hit the market that um, is better than this camera body. So, I mean, because the Z cam doesn't have IBIS, the S1 takes it for this category. So next category is file sizes and storage. So for the Lumix S1, you just use regular SD cards. Now I can get away with SD cards that shoot at around 80 megabytes per second. Um, or record at 80 megabytes per second. Um, it works perfectly fine with this, even shooting all the way up to 4K, 24 FPS and 10 bit, as well as any of the high variable frame rate options that this camera offers. Um, so basically out of a 128 gigabyte SD card, I'll get around the two hours and 30 minute mark or two hours, 20 minute mark, which is plenty of footage to play around with for, you know, like a 50, $60 SD card. So moving on to the Z cam. Now the Z cam uses CFast storage, which is a good and a bad thing um, because CFast, they do cost a lot more money. Um, I have two 256 gigabyte cards from Angelbird. I haven't had any problems with those ones. I do see sometimes people buying some cheaper CFast cards because they are so expensive and sometimes they don't work. So just to be careful with that, I paid about $600 Canadian for two of those cards uh, in total, which is 512 gigabytes of storage, um, which really at the end of the day, isn't a lot for video. As well as when you're using this camera, it doesn't really compress footage depending on the codec that you're shooting in. So for example, when I shoot ProRes, which is a editing kind of codec, it basically helps my computer run a lot smoother, um, but it also makes the file sizes a lot bigger. There also is RAW, which as everyone knows, are big file sizes. So coming from an A7 III to the Z cam, it was a bit of a change and a bit of a curveball for me because I just really had to get used to, you know, having that massive file sizes and having to re-up on some more storage. Um, so for that reason, um, the S1 will definitely take the cake because the Z cam definitely does have larger file sizes, which means you have to buy more storage and you're looking at buying CFast cards or potentially an SSD which is gonna cost you a little bit more in the long term than buying those $50 SD cards. The next category we're talking about is photography. Now, most of the times, if you're buying a cinema camera, you're not looking to take photos. And I knew that 100% going into buying this camera. However, it does have the option to take photos which is awesome. The photos are actually pretty good. They're 26 megapixels, which is awesome. Now, I definitely wouldn't recommend using this as a photography camera, just because I said the autofocus is pretty bad. So you're gonna have to manually focus all of your photos. Um, with that being said, I'm gonna hand it over to the S1. So yeah, the S1 obviously takes it for this category just because it does have like a specific photo option to take photos on this camera and the autofocus works pretty decent for photos. Um, I've definitely used this camera for photos before with the autofocus, without the autofocus. It's very simple. There's, um, I believe it shoots like 6K um, raw photos on this camera as well, which is awesome. Um, I mean, again, autofocus isn't the best, but it is still technically a photo camera. It's more tailored towards video, but it's still a hybrid camera. At the end of the day, it's a DSLR. It will shoot good video and good photo. So the S1 takes it for the photography section. The next category that we have is slow motion. 
Now the Z-Cam shoots in a bunch of different variable frame rates. So for example, it can shoot 48 frames per second, 60 frames per second, 75 frames per second at 4K. Um, that's pretty awesome to have the ability to shoot at a 75 frames per second in 4K because I find personally for me, I don't use 120 all that often. Um, I just don't find that I need it. I find that 75 is slow enough for me. In 6K, you can get up to 48 frames per second, which is, to me, that's awesome because that's literally 50% of what you'd be shooting at a regular 24 frames per second timeline. I love the fact that this has so many different options for variable frame rates, but now we're gonna talk about the S1. So the S1 has uh, 4K 60 for slow motion. So it's nice that you actually have the 4K option for slow motion, but then after that, you need to downscale to 1080p to shoot 150 FPS and all the way up to 180 FPS. So it's nice that you have the option for super slow motion, like the 180, which the Z cam only goes up to 120. However, you're downscaling to 1080p, so it can get a little noisy at times. Um, I like to only shoot with the variable frame rates at 150 and 180 if I have really well lit locations or I'm shooting outdoors in daylight. When we did compare the side-by-side -side footage of the S1 and the Z cam with um, the S1 was shooting at 150 FPS and the Z cam was shooting at 120 FPS. And the quality seemed to look the same. Yeah, it was very close at least. Like I, we couldn't tell any differences. We tried punching in and we just didn't really notice any sort of like unnecessary amount of grain going on or any resolution drops or anything. It looked very similar. So that's why we're gonna give it a draw between the two. Again, when we compared the 60 FPS with the um, 60 FPS on the Lumix S1, it looked very similar. There wasn't any wow factor between like one or the other. So that's why we're gonna give it a draw. So next category is gonna be battery life. So the Lumix S1 um, outputs about two and a half hours of battery, of continuous recording. So chances are when you're on a shoot, you're not gonna be having the camera turned on the entire time, unless of course you're shooting a very long interview. But other than that, I can get through at least a few shoots with a full battery, just because I'm constantly turning the camera off and on throughout the shoot. But two and a half hours is what you're gonna get out of this um, camera battery. Now, if you want to purchase more camera batteries for the Lumix S1, I'm pretty sure it's over $100 to purchase a battery for the Lumix S1. Now with the Z cam, Dyson's gonna go over how the batteries are a little more cost effective and uh, lasts a little longer than the Lumix S1. So for the Z cam, it actually uses NPF batteries and these are super common batteries. A lot of people have them. Um, for example, this is the NPF 970 battery, which I find lasts me about two to three hours. Um, most of the time, it'll be about three hours. I can usually get away with just this battery for long periods of time, as well as you can also get V-mount batteries and hook them up super easy to this camera. Um, the thing about these batteries is that they are very cost effective. For a pack of two of the NPF 970, you're looking at only about $50 and basically that will come with a charger. So at the end of the day, I think the battery life is great off of these batteries. I find that these batteries are super common and they're super affordable. You can get them off Amazon, basically with that next day shipping too as well. So for this category, we're gonna say that the Z cam wins. The next category we're gonna be talking about is accessories as well as lens options slash mounting options. Um, I love the fact that the Z cam, you can get a ton of different accessories for this. Um, it, you can buy cages like the small rig cage you actually can buy a Rick Revolver clutch handle, which for the Z cam will come with a record button as well as a dial. So you can control the Z cam, which is pretty awesome and unique. Another thing with the Z cam and accessories is it actually has an END right here. You can actually buy an electronic ND, which is awesome. You don't have to worry about having an ND in front of your lens. Another thing that I love about Z cam and what they do is that they have different mounting options. They have the EF, which I currently have, which I think has the best lens setup because there's so many lenses that are meant for EF uh, mounts that you can buy at a relatively cheap price. It also comes with a micro four thirds mount. So if you wanted to get a cheaper anamorphic rather than a full frame, uh, you can definitely do that with this camera as well as I think it'll come with a PL mount as well. Uh, these are only about a hundred US dollars to actually buy a different mount. So for the Lumix S1, um, 
This is an L mount camera, so kind of unique, I guess. It's a Leica mount. Um, there's not a whole lot of L mount lenses out there. And if there are lens options out there for the L mount, they're very expensive lenses. This Sigma 35 mil was around the thousand dollar mark, I believe, Canadian. And if I wanna put a Canon EF mount on here, I actually have to buy the MC21 adapter, which runs me about $250. And then I have access to all of the Canon mount lenses. So the fact that the lens adapter is like $250, which is a little pricey to be able to use the Canon EF mount lenses. And I'm pretty sure the L mount lenses can creep up to that like $2,500 to $3,000 mark for an L mount lens, which is like insanely expensive. So for this category, the Z cam takes it just because this is a L mount and there's just not very many options right out of the box for this camera without buying a, an adapter. So the next category that we have is the exposure tools. So straight up the Lumix S1 only has the histogram. So that's really the only exposure tool that I'm given. Um, we'll hand it straight off to the Z cam because it has a bunch of awesome tools that this camera offers. This camera is awesome if you're trying to get the correct exposure because it has so many different tools. It has the waveform, it has the vector scope, it has the histogram, it has focus peaking as well. So that's gonna help out when you're actually trying to grab focus. And that's just another thing that a cinema camera will typically have over a DSLR or mirrorless camera. So I think for this category, it's pretty easy and straightforward. The Z cam wins this one. This next category is overall image quality. And this is probably to me, one of the most important categories in any camera review that you're looking at. Um, I love that this has that cinematic look. There's just something different about this look compared to a DSLR or mirrorless camera. It just gives off those movie style vibes that you're really looking for once you're trying to get into the higher end production stuff. It just makes the image overall a little bit softer rather than having a bunch of fake sharpness from your typical DSLR or mirrorless cameras. I think the Z cam does an awesome job with the overall image quality. And so far I've started to fall in love with this camera. And another great option about the Z cam is the codex. You are able to shoot in ProRes you're able to shoot in Z-RAW. You can have the option to do ProRes 422 HQ, LT, Proxy. You also can change it into H.265 if you're looking for smaller file sizes or even H.264 for even smaller sizes, but you are gonna be going down to 8-bit depth. Yeah, so with the S1, like Dyson said, the DSLRs are just very sharp out of the body. You get a unnatural look. The cinema camera, the softness, the highlights, everything just looks so good with these cameras. So the Z cam 100% takes it. The S1, it's your typical DSLR look, um, whether you're filming off of a Canon 1DX Mark III, a Sony a7 III, S1, S1H, they all have that over sharpened, unnatural look that a cinema camera just doesn't have. So the Z cam takes it for this one. So the last category we have is the price point. So the price of the uh, Lumix S1 is $2,500. Very affordable in my opinion for a DSLR camera, for a full frame DSLR camera that's tailored towards video, $2,500 in my opinion, very affordable. And with the Z cam, it is actually about $3,500 Canadian to buy it. However, you do have to bring in all of those additional costs, like the C Fast cards, those are gonna cost you about 600 for two 256 gigabyte cards, as well as you're looking at all of these different accessories on here. You're also potentially looking at a follow focus too. So with all those accessories, you're probably looking at upwards of about, you know, four to five grand, maybe even six, depending on what you get. Um, so you have to keep that in mind with the price that it does add up once you start buying all the bits and pieces. Um, and that's something that I kind of knew going forward. That's why I was okay with buying the Z cam, just because I knew that you have to buy the accessories. You have to buy all these little things to make the camera more usable. So for this reason, the Lumix S1 is definitely gonna win because it's at a much more affordable price and you still get such a great quality image out of it. So that's a wrap for the Lumix S1 and Z cam comparison video. So all in all guys, for the price that the S1 has at $2,500, the fact that it's a DSLR, it's very easy to use right out of the box. You don't have to buy anything other than a lens and an SD card to get out and shoot. So at the end of the day, the S1, any mirrorless DSLR camera 
is just tailored towards somebody that just wants to take the camera out and shoot. Um, there's not a lot of setup required. There's not a lot of extra bits and pieces that you have to purchase to rig it out. So yeah, this is totally tailored towards maybe even a hybrid shooter, somebody that wants the option to also shoot photos. Just an all around camera that you can use on just day to day shoots. Now the Z cam is something that I think will help people who are looking more towards the production style of shooting. Um, this does take a little bit of time to rig up. You have to get the cage on, you have to get the top handle, side handle, monitor, potentially your mat box, even your rails with your focus pull. All those little things are gonna account in your time for setup. So this definitely is more for somebody who doesn't like the run and gun style, but at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter what camera you're using. It's all about the user and how you're using it. If you're looking for that cinematic look at an entry level price, I think this is a great option. You can look at this camera or even the F6 potentially, which is a full frame version of this guy, which has better dynamic range, has better low light capabilities, is definitely more expensive, but I think it's an awesome camera. I would definitely recommend this to somebody who's looking to do more narrative stuff. If they're looking into music videos, potentially something that you are going to actually be setting up sets with and having more of a production style rather than just trying to pick up your camera and go. Yeah, so that's basically a wrap for today's video, guys. Um, comment down below, what do you guys shoot with? Do you use DSLR cameras or do you use a cinema grade camera? Let us know in the comments down below. But with all that being said, thanks everyone for watching. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. We'll catch you on the next video. Peace.